consideration last week of the promised seed of Abraham after 25 years from the calling that God invited him to from Paran and into and from his fatherland or homeland, he's now called into this land that God had promised him. And each time God made him a promise, a little more detail was given. You will have a son, God said. Well, is it my servant Eliezer? Is he going to be the one? No, it will be someone from your own bowels. Years later, oh, that Ishmael may live before you. No, it will not be Ishmael. It will be a son from you and Sarah. Abraham had faith that what God had said he would do. That's the main point that we really want to take from the life of Abraham. Tonight, we're going to look at something I think that is a, a remarkable challenge to his faith. After all these promises and all the time that passes, we don't really understand all the outworkings of God, God's plan, but we do have confidence that he will do what he has promised, just as he did with Abraham. Before we begin tonight, please join me as we open with a word of prayer. Our gracious and almighty Father in heaven, how wonderful is your name, and how wonderful is that plan of salvation that you've given to us, that we may have the opportunity to open your word, to read from it, and to be instructed in your ways. We pray that you will help us in our understanding of this book of Genesis, for we understand it provides many of the foundation principles that help us understand the rest of the Bible. And so we pray that you will help us in our understanding to see clearly the message that you've revealed here. We pray that you'll watch over us this night, that you'll bless our speakers as they present to us, and that you will help us in our learning. We ask these things through your Son, even our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to just go over this quickly. I want you, for your tips and tools, to listen for echoes. And that what that means is, think of where you've heard of the point before. One example is, we've talked last week about the seed that was promised to Abraham, but we already considered this extensively when we considered Adam and Eve and talked about the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. There is an echo back to the Garden in Eden, and that's what we're talking about. By the time we come to the New Testament, there are many echoes back to the Old Testament. And when we read, we should note important points, for they will be used in other parts of the Bible. Themes is another aspect of our consideration. We sometimes get the whole thought, uh, not just an individual word, but thoughts and ideas that we can refer to and refer back to into the Old Testament. We're going to read from Genesis chapter 22 tonight, speaking of Abraham and all the years that had passed with the piecemeal unfolding of the plan that God had for him. After everything he went through to have the promised seed, as we talked about, our topic tonight puts the icing on top of that challenge to his face, faith. So let's read uh, Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 19. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I will go with the goat, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them together, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham, Abraham built there an altar 
and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him up on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, as, he, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up to, and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. Tonight we're going to start with Jonathan, and he's going to uh, tell us all about the sacrifice of Isaac that we've just considered. So Jonathan? Okay. You got it. Thank, thanks, Bill. We're good to go there. Yep. So I'm uh, in a little different location than I have been normally. So hopefully things work out here. I also don't have as many uh, people in the room with me and a slightly different setup that we've got here. So hopefully things work out all right. All right. Uh, tonight, uh, as Bill said, kind of wrapping up Abraham, we, we never really get away from Abraham or Abraham is really the, the foundation for faith, um, as tonight we'll see resurrection of our hope um, and uh, this uh, contrast between faith and works that we see with Abraham. Uh, so just a quick recap. Maybe if this will go. <clears throat> so last week uh, we had Ishmael born of Hagar, right? Abraham's firstborn son. Um, through through Hagar. Uh, Lot was rescued, but his family was destroyed. Lot went down into Sodom, that wicked city. Uh, eventually, God tries to pull him out of, uh, out of Sodom, but uh, his wife looks back, uh, was too tied to the stuff, and was not able to, to come out. Finally, we have the promised seed. Abraham's second son is born, but the seed of promise the one from Sarah uh, and not from Ishmael. Uh, and we looked at those two kind of the, um, the difference between the seed of the promise and, and the natural seed. <clears throat> and then finally we had Ishmael was thrown out, was removed and would not um, be around Isaac because of the mocking that he did of, uh, of Isaac. <clears throat> so we now have the promised seed is born. Abraham has waited a hundred years for this moment. Um, he's been waiting approximately 25 years since he was promised this seed, and now he finally gets it. Finally, it finally comes, and it's just, it's so exciting. I'm sure Abraham and, and Sarah would have been just so thrilled, but then we get this in, in Genesis 22, and, and when we have things that are very different, and then you think very strange in the Bible, that's a time to really pay attention and to consider what's going on here. So you have this promised seed, and God's like, yeah, I'm going to give you the seed. And then the first two verses that we have here, it's like, oh, hey, go and kill your son. That's pretty crazy. So th that right away, we need to pay attention to this because there's some huge principles and some very, very important lessons that come out from this chapter that outline uh, very important things for us and for the rest of scripture and the doctrine um, that comes out. So we have there Genesis 22, 1 and 2, and it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham 
and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee unto the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. So we're going to kind of consider those three things, this idea of temptation or testing. Uh, we are going to look at a little bit, the third thing we're actually going to look at is take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, uh, and we're going to consider the type of, of that to, to Jesus. And then we're going to consider this idea of this burnt offering, complete sacrifice, uh, and the idea of resurrection is actually going to be the second thing that we're going to consider. So first thing is this idea of, of testing or tempting that we have here. There's different kinds of testing. Um, we have here the, the Concorde, a little bit of an older plane, um, but still a, a plane that was tested. Um, there was five, five models that they tested. One of those prototype models, they tested the metal in that model until it broke, until it destroyed. Um, it completely kind of broke apart. And that was part of the testing to make sure that this plane flew and, 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 and was a good plane. Um, complete the complete destruction. Okay, that's one type of testing. You can test something um, until it until it breaks. Uh, generally, if you go and test drive your car, just so we can see that again, because it's lots of fun. Oh, I, have to, I think I have to go back all the way. Yeah. Oh, normally, <laughs> when you go and test drive a car, you don't normally go and test it and then like crash it and be like, oh, yeah, how good is this thing in, in, a, in a crash? No, you, you test drive it and you maybe see how, how quickly it can stop or maybe how fast it can accelerate or maybe how quickly it can swerve, but you don't generally test a car until it, and it breaks, right? You just kind of test it out and make sure, okay, this, this, this works okay, okay? So different types of testing. And that's what we've got here with Abraham. God is testing him to see what kind, what he's made out of. Uh, how, how good is his faith? Um, how, how well is he able to listen and follow through with instructions? So he is testing Abraham's faith on its quality and its value. He's not trying to break or destroy Abraham in, in this test that he is putting. Now we have to, there's a, two words that we've got here, this idea of testing and this idea of temptation. And we're not going to look at it too deeply, and we'll consider it just a little bit. Um, but there are two different ideas. A temptation is something that takes us away from God's commandments, and a test is just seeing if we will actually follow through um, with God's commandment. <clears throat> so here's another uh, reference we have in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2, about God's uh, testing of Israel. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. So this idea of proving, would Israel actually keep God's commandments? Same thing that we have here with Abraham. God is proving him, is testing him. Will you actually do what I have asked you to do? Same kind of principle. Let's Turn this one up in our Bibles in, in 1 Corinthians 10. And this here talks about temptation and, and testing um, and clearly outlines something that's really important for us to always remember because we're going to go through tough times in our lives. And, and things will, will be very, very, can be very, very difficult for us. And sometimes it's like, this is too much. God, I can't handle this anymore. I believe that you're in my life. I believe that you're caring for me. I believe that you're directing my life. These things that are coming on me are just, I, I don't think I can handle them. But when we consider 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, it's really uh, comforting for us to always keep this in the back of our mind because God knows us and God knows how much we can handle. It says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Okay, so that lots and lots of us have gone through different temptations, and there's something you're not the only one who's ever gone through this, right? It might seem like I'm the only one who's ever done this, but there's been 6,000 years of history, all sorts of different situations and scenarios have gone on, uh, and God um, has, has brought different tests into all sorts of different people's lives. So again, we can take comfort of that. I'm not the only one who's ever experienced this. And then the second part of the reference there, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. He's not going to test us more than we can handle. He's promised us that, and then finally, but will with the temptation 
also make in a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay, so God has promised that he will provide ways, provide avenues, provide an escape for these tests, for these temptations that are come, going to come on us in our lives. So if you can always remember that, it might not necessarily make it any easier, all right? It's going to be tough, but God says, I will help you through it. We will be able to get through this uh, with this temptation. And again, this is exactly what we see going on with Abraham. Your only son, the son who you love, go and sacrifice him, go and kill him. Wow, that is that would be incredibly difficult to do. Well, we'll see how this all works out and how God provides and looks after Abraham. <clears throat> So the second thing um, that we've got here, so this, that's the idea of the test. Now we're going to kind of consider this idea of the, the burnt offering. What was actually going on here that God had asked Abraham to do? Um, there's a whole bunch of different, there's actually six offerings in the law. Um, here we just listed the three of them, burnt, trespass, and peace offerings. There's various different ones and different things um, and that would go on when you actually made these sacrifices. Uh, and they would stand for things and they represented uh, different um, uh, relationships, different ideas uh, in worship um, with, with God. Well, the burnt offering represented total dedication, complete and utter dedication to God. The whole animal, everything was sacrificed, um, was, was given completely to God. And that's what God asks Abraham to do was a burnt offering, a complete and utter dedication, giving everything to God, um, and with his son in, in, in offering his son. All right, so that's what we've got here. So in this test, is Abraham is asked to give completely and utterly the whole thing. Um, so now as we look at this, we're gonna just we're gonna run through these key points, keep these in the back of your mind as we go through, and then we're gonna see how they uh relate to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so we've got this idea of thine only son. It ring any bells, the only begotten son. Go to Moriah. I don't know if anybody knows where Moriah is, but Moriah is the actual location of Jerusalem. And in a few hundred years um, on, this is actually where Jerusalem is going to be built on Moriah. Hmm, interesting, Jerusalem. Abraham got up early. Again, he was, he was willing to get this done. The third day, hmm, another interesting echo that we've got there. Abraham and Isaac went alone. The two of them together went and did this. He promised that he would come again. And we'll consider that in just a second. He laid the wood on Isaac, right? He, the, he, Isaac bore the wood. He carried the wood. And they went together um, in, in this sacrifice. They, they were in this together. Uh, and then finally, Isaac is bound um, by Abraham, Abraham being well over 100 years old at this point, Isaac being a probably a teenager, uh, would have been probably a little difficult if Isaac wasn't a willing participant for Abraham to bind him to actually uh, to tie him up. Isaac probably could have escaped quite easily. So um, now, so we've got this sacrifice here. So Abraham is willing to do what God asked him to do to the, to the ultimate, right? To sacrifice his son, to give up everything and, and to sacrifice um, him. Isaac is willing is to go along with this sacrifice. Eventually, though, God provides a way of escape. Abraham is willing to do it. He says he'll go through with it. He's right there. But ultimately, God says no. And I think it's really interesting if you're back, if you can flip back to Genesis, Abraham is so willing to do this that God actually has to tell him twice, has to call out his name twice to get him to stop. Abraham's got the knife and he's ready to kill his son, having complete and utter faith. And we'll talk about why he's able, he's willing to kill him. Um, but God has to call out to Abraham twice in verse 11, Abraham. Abraham still kind of, and he's like, Abraham, like, whoa, stop. Um, don't kill your son. And he provides a way of escape from this. So let's now talk about the reason and the principles uh, that come out from this sacrifice. What was the but what was behind Abraham's action in offering his son as a burnt offering? Let's look at these types that come out for us and the principles and the doctrines that we get from this uh, uh, account of Abraham offering his son Isaac. 
All right. So the story of Abraham and Isaac is a type. And that's what uh, Bill was talking about at the beginning there, a type of what was to happen in the life of Jesus Christ. So this was to tell people, this is what we need to look forward to. This is the type of sacrifice that God is going to do. So right from Genesis, all the people would have been looking for this type of action to have happened, just like went, what went on here. And we see that in John chapter 16, behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you shall be scattered every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the father is with me. Right. So we, we saw that, that Abraham and Isaac went on alone um, and it was just the two of them. But uh, we see here also that, that God was with Christ uh, going with him uh, to, to the cross as, as well. Uh, here's another reference. They again talks about this as the type of, of Christ. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, when he was tempted, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So now this is where this really important doctrine comes out. Abraham was promised that Isaac would be the one who would carry on his line. Isaac was the one who was going to also have kids and who the promises would go down to. So this is where we understand the doctrine of resurrection. And verse 19 says that accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. So Abraham believed in the resurrection from the dead, because if he believed, if he was like, yeah, God asked me to kill my son. But God also promised me that this son whom I'm about to kill is going to be the one whose seed, whose descendants were going to uh, inherit the promises, who the promises were going to come through. He's got to be alive. Isaac has to be alive in order for those promises that God promised me to be fulfilled. So even if I do kill him, God has to raise him from the dead because he's the one who the promises is going to go through. So this doctrine of the resurrection of the dead is the foundation principle of Abraham's faith. Abraham believed in the resurrection of the dead. And that's what we also need to believe in. That's the hope of Abraham is resurrection, is that even though we die, there will, come, will, will be a, a time when we will be resurrected um, from from the dead. <clears throat> All right. And then we have the second point here um, where the ram um, is taken and is actually sacrificed. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, behind him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. So Abraham's only son, Isaac, was spared. Isaac experienced the typical, a type of death and resurrection. Okay, so it just showed, okay, this is what is going to happen, where ultimately Jesus, God's only son, Jesus, was not spared. Jesus experienced an actual death and resurrection. Okay, so Isaac showed what kind of was going to happen, and then Jesus actually did it. And that happens throughout the Old Testament. All of these events, all of these stories, all of these accounts, all of these things point forward to actually what was going to happen in Jesus and just showed eventually, okay, this is what is going to happen. So the people in the Old Testament would understand, okay, this is what is going to happen. This is how I, I believe. This is my faith is based on these things. These are the doctrines that God is trying to teach us and show us uh, what we should actually be believing in. In Abraham, it was believing in the resurrection, that there would come a time when complete sacrifice was necessary, giving up everything, Jesus did that ultimately and completely, and we try and follow in that same way. And Abraham did that, and in his faith, um, he actually demonstrated his faith uh, in, in doing what God had asked him to do, just like we are asked to demonstrate our faith in following through on the doctrines and the commandments uh, of our God. So here we have um, those, those, uh, that slide that we had earlier, and then how Jesus fulfills all of those things. Thine only son, the only begotten son of God. Go to Moriah, who's crucified at Jerusalem, same place. Abraham got up early. Jesus was crucified in early in the morning. On the third day, three-year ministry, or on the three days and three nights that Jesus was in the grave. Abraham and Isaac went together. Sorry, pardon me. God was always with Jesus. Uh, he was promised to come again. 
Jesus was promised to come again, not only at the resurrection, but ultimately at the end time when Jesus would come again. Laid the wood on Isaac. Jesus bore his cross. He bound Isaac, willing participant, and Jesus said, thy will be done, uh, not mine. Jesus was a willing participant in this ultimate sacrifice. So when Abraham had clearly demonstrated his faith, the promises are confirmed. The final time that these promises are confirmed to Abraham and God says, yes, absolutely, uh, you will be given these things. That In your seed, it will, it will happen. And this is in chapter 22 of Genesis, kind of starting in verse 16, um, that the promises that were given in Genesis 12 and Genesis 13 and 15, all the way through, they are reiterated here and confirmed. That when God sees Abraham's faith and works, uh, you believe, but then you do something about it. It's not good enough just to believe and say, yeah, yeah, I believe, right? If I believed that this hotel was on fire, I would put that belief into action and I would do something about it, right? Someone comes and knocks on the door and says, oh yeah, the hotel's on fire. And I'm like, I don't really believe you. There's no way it is. I wouldn't do anything about it. But if you believe, if you actually believe that God said, Jesus is coming back, are you ready? Or do you need to get baptized? Are you going to do it? Or love your neighbor as yourself? If you actually believe that God is telling the truth, then we act on it and we do something about it. And that's what Abraham does here. He believes and then he demonstrates that belief in action. And God commends him for that, that his, his seed would be blessed. This seed that we've got here um, that is, is uh, um, mentioned in, in verse 17 and 18, and we've talked about this as well. Seed is an old English word meaning children, descendants. It's both plural and singular. The plural, Abraham's descendants are literally the Jews, many of them, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel come out of Jacob. It can also be us, believers in Christ. We looked at that in, in Galatians chapter 3, how we are adopted into the family of, um, of Abraham, and we can inherit those promises. But it's also singular, one person, the seed being Jesus Christ. He is the ultimate seed of Abraham. In Jesus, all the promises made to Abraham are fulfilled. We've already talked about this. I've already kind of stressed it, jumped ahead of myself. Faith and works. And James talks about this. If our faith is only just faith, it's, it's dead. It's not good enough. We have to back up our faith with some works. We have to do something about our faith. Whew, got it in. We knew that was going to be a quick one. So hopefully that wasn't too much too quick. Um, it's in your notes as as well if you want to reread that if you have any questions or anything else that you would like to address write them down uh we won't take up any of pete's time um but at the end if there's anything else you'd like us to kind of re-go over there uh that is the sacrifice of isaac resurrection faith and works the two major principles that we get out of there We're just going to let Pete jump right in and deal with the death of Sarah and wife for Isaac. I know he's got a big section, so we're going to let him try and get through. <laughs> That's okay. I think uh, I think we'll be okay. I'm just going to share my screen. I think is this one here. Hope it is. There we go. The death of Sarah. Is everybody uh, seeing my screen as I am? Yes. yes. Oh, th thank you, Bill. Well, good evening, everybody. I do apologize um, for being away for the last two weeks. Uh, I think you've been in good hands. I've been uh, traveling a little bit and also doing some other teaching classes, but it's good to be back with you all again this evening. So Jonathan then has taken us through that incredible act and show of faith uh, of Abraham, who had actually been prepared to, to sacrifice his own son because his belief and faith in God was concrete that God would be able to raise him again from the dead in the future, um, because that's where the seed was going to come through. What we're going to look at uh, briefly now is the death, the sad death of Isaac's mother, Sarah. Uh, and then we'll go and look at um, the selection process uh, for a wife for this chosen uh, seed of, uh, of promise. So Sarah then, um, 
she uh, comes to the end of her life after 127 years. We know that in the Genesis record, when we looked back at some of the, the older patriarchs, Noah, for example, who lived uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, that uh, men and women's lives were slowly getting shorter and shorter. And here at 127, Sarah, um, in Genesis chapter 23, right at the beginning of this chapter, um, falls asleep and, um, and passes away. And uh, we read that uh, Sarah died in Kirjath Jarba. So we actually have the physical location. Um, the name is also the same uh, called Hebron. Um, so that's actually a city that exists on the map today. Now, uh, we know that uh, city today in the land of Israel, of course. And when we look back at Sarah's life, we know when we look at scripture and we compare um, Genesis chapter 12 to Genesis chapter 17 and look through some of the chronology there of, of, of events and how old Abraham and Sarah were at these different times, that she would have been about 60 when Abraham was first called out of Ur. And she would have been 65 when they finally, do you remember, they traveled north, they stayed uh, at uh, Haran and then traveled down south into the land of Canaan before going on to uh, down into Egypt. She would have been 65 when they entered Canaan. And it was another 11 years after that, that she got so frustrated that this seed, this promise wasn't being fulfilled quickly enough that she uh, almost forced the situation of Hagar and Abraham to bring forth a child into the household. She was 76 when Ishmael was born. And then she had to wait another 13 years, 13 years, what an incredible test of patience that was for Sarah. Do you remember she laughed within herself uh, when it was suggested that she in her old age could bring forth this seed of promise. But God being, of course, true to his promise and true to his word, uh, brought forth uh, Isaac through Sarah, through, through Abraham and, and Sarah's own marriage. And this seed of promise was born. She was 90 years old, of course, when Isaac was born. Abraham was 100 years old. Absolutely incredible, isn't it? If you could imagine that today, it would be front page news, wouldn't it? It would be world news if a 90-year-old brought forth uh, a baby today. And so Isaac is born, and then 37 years she's going to spend with her seed uh, of promise, with her son of promise, Isaac. And there she dies at the age of 127. And we're told, aren't we, in Genesis chapter 23, that Abraham actually has to go and procure some land um, and uh, arrange for the burial of his wife. Genesis chapter 23 and verses 3 and 4 tell us, Abraham stood up from before his dead, from his wife, and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I'm a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you that I may bury my dead out of my sight. So he has to go to those that are living in the land, the sons of Heth, and actually purchase uh, a place to actually bury his beloved wife. It's clear to us, and isn't it, that Abraham clearly understood that even though God had promised him physically this land, he didn't own any of it in his lifetime. He actually had to go and spend money to purchase a plot of land um, to, and a place to bury his, his wife. He clearly understood that the promise was a possession in the future, which would therefore, as Jonathan has already mentioned, necessitate the resurrection, a physical resurrection from the dead. One of the really um, emotional things, I think, we read over it very easily, but one of the emotional things for me is in verse two, right at the end of that verse, we read the beginning of the verse uh, that Sarah passes away and dies in Hebron, but Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. He'd been with her for probably nearly a hundred years of his life. He clearly, clearly believed that she was going to rise again from the dead at some point in the future to receive the promise. She had to rise again from the dead. And this is actually the first time in all of scripture that this word is used, mourn. He was sad. Not, not that he was never going to see her again, but he was going to miss her now through the duration of the rest of his life. See, Sarah had been 50% of who Abraham was. They had walked together, hadn't they, through their lives. They'd been through so much together. 
all of the highs and all of the lows and the test and the patience. And finally, this seed of promise was born. She's mentioned in Hebrews 11. Do you remember Hebrews 11 is that beautiful catalogue of all those faithful men and women who acted upon their faith? And Sarah is right there in verse 11 uh, in that catalogue of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. Through faith also, Sarah herself receives strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age at 90 years old. Why? Because she judged him faithful who had promised. This wasn't Abraham who was kind of trying to convince his wife. She assessed who God was and what God was capable of. And she believed, although she laughed originally, laughing aside, she firmly believed. And that too brought about this seed of promise. And let us not forget Peter's beautiful words in his epistle in the New Testament. He reminds the, the young women uh, how to behave and to look to their husbands, just as Sarah, says Peter, obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And the interesting thing is, when we go back to Genesis, she never verbally calls Abraham Lord at all. We read what's going on in her mind. She had such respect for her husband that she would call him Lord in her mind. How many of us do that with our spouses and elevate them in our minds? Uh, and verse 7 of, of this 1 Peter chapter 3, Peter says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with your wives, with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Sometimes we think of just Abraham receiving these covenants of promise, but it needed Sarah too. These were promises that were given to them both. Well, they received nothing, did they, in their lifetime? In fact, so many that worked so hard and, and acted on their faith hadn't received the promise. Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40 tells us that all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. And here's the wonderful thing for you and I. God having provided some better thing for us, that they, throughout all their actions of faith, without us, should not be made perfect. God has extended time enough and extended the inv invitation for you and I to be partakers of that promise when they are raised again uh, to live in his kingdom. What an incredible verse that is when we really understand it. And so do you remember those promises that we went over and over again, but they're so important because they're repeated over and over again for us to understand how important they are. God had said, Abraham, look to the north, the, the east, the south and the west, all the land uh, which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever, forever. The only way that Abraham and Sarah can partake of that promise is to be raised again from the dead. What does that mean for you and I? Right at the end of, of Hebrews, actually, once we go past chapter 11 and, and 12, we get this lovely verse, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 14, because this actually makes us think, doesn't it, about all the things that we have and enjoy every day in our lives, the homes we live in. I haven't paid off my house yet, but I've been told that when you do, the grass feels very different under your feet. There's a sense of ownership that it's yours. But actually, when we pass away, when we take our final breath, it's nothing, is it? It means nothing. We cannot take it with us into the grave. And so we need to have this thought of Hebrews 13, verse 14, for here now we have no continuing city. We have no permanence, actually, in this life. But we seek one to come in the future, just like Abraham and just like Sarah had the faith to see and be convinced of something in the future. So Sarah then has, uh, has died. Abraham now is alone. And can you imagine being alone after all that time? The responsibilities now of raising a family. I know they weren't young children as much now, but you're still the head of your house without a wife. And we need to also remember the customs in Abraham's time. It was very customary for women, um, the females, to arrange marriages. And in fact, even in 2022, in certain cultures around the world, in India, for example, and Pakistan, and, and some of those other Asian cultures, marriages are arranged, aren't they? Um, 
there is due diligence that is done between families. And in fact, it's not just the groom and the bride that are kind of investigated. It's actually their peer groups and it's their parents that are all brought together. And uh, these um, marriages are assessed on how they're going to be in the future in terms of good stock. Is, it, is this person going to be good stock? Um, is it going to come into my family or is she going to come into my family and, uh, and continue good character? So th there's a lot of things that go on in, in arranged marriages. But Sarah was dead, of course. She had no part that could be played in a, finding a suitable wife for her son, Isaac, who is now going to be nearly 40 years old. And so all of that responsibility was going to fall upon his father, Abraham. What was Abraham's plan then? So actually, most of this now is out of Genesis chapter 24, if you want to read through. We haven't got time to read through. It's a, it's a long chapter. It's an interesting chapter. But we're going to really kind of plow through uh, the narrative this evening and just see the process. And we can adopt the same process, when, not if we're just looking for a wife or for a husband, but who we choose to partner with uh, and have associations with on our walk towards God's kingdom. So Genesis chapter 23, verses two and three, if we can read those, Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, put I pray thee thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. And so he'd called his his uh, most senior person in his household uh, to come and to carry out this task. So obviously, Abraham had a lot of confidence in the steward of his house. And what was the plea? It was to find a wife for his 40-year-old son, this important son, this seed of promise. And there was one thing that Abraham really needed, and that was that this steward was not going to go locally and try and find uh, one of the local women from the Canaanites that were living in the land. Abraham had obviously looked at the lifestyle um, around him and the social environment and it recognized straight away that the, whoever the steward would have picked locally would not be a suitable pairing for his son, this seed of promise, Isaac. And it's essential for us, isn't it, when we understand what a wife is or what a husband is, um, that we are to be helpmeets, if, if you like, for each other. If we go right the way back to the creation record a few weeks back, or quite a few weeks back now, when we started to look at Genesis, we looked at this divine plan, this, this, this design that God had of pairing man with the woman and woman with the man. It was no accident that God brought all of his creation, all of his living creation, all of the animals in front of Adam. Adam. And we've got that picture, haven't we, of Adam naming all of the animals, just giving them names. Well, that wasn't really what was intended here as the, 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 the main reason for this appearing of the animals. It was to show Adam that actually when he assessed all of these other creatures, there was not a creature that would help him on his walk. There wasn't a creature that he could have meaningful conversations with um, uh, during his life. And so he was made very aware of that. And God said in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. That's not help meet as in M-E-A-T, a slave, um, somebody that Adam could just you know, put all of the, the, the burdens that he didn't want to do onto. This was a, a, a help and assistance that was suitable um, for his, his walk. Who was then the eldest servant of Abraham? Well, we actually find out his name. It is, if you go to Genesis chapter 15, if you've got your, uh, your Bibles there, we can just read the first two verses after these things the word of the lord came unto abraham in a vision saying fear not abraham i am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward so god then is about to again repeat the promises to him but 
Abraham, again, has doubts. He's old. His wife is old. And he wants to try and find another solution. Verse 2, Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? I still haven't had this seed. And the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. So we have the name, don't we, of, of uh, this steward, this chief servant of Abraham's uh, household. Do you remember Abraham in a previous chapter, chapter 14, uh, when he went out to go and fight uh, that battle in chapter 14, he had 318 in his house that went with him. So this was a big group of people, wasn't it, in Abraham's house? And we, we find out that Eliezer actually means God of help. And we're going to see just how God helped Eliezer in a moment in his task. So what was wrong then with with Isaac marrying a local Canaanite woman. We know that Abraham desperately didn't want that. But what was wrong with the local Canaanite women? Well, their beliefs. They, they didn't know the God that Abraham knew. They didn't know the God of creation. They were basically a, a fertility cult. Um, there were temples uh, scattered around about in the land of Canaan where men and women would, would go to worship the whole reproductive process. And so there were essentially prostitutes at these temple sites that would work. Um, and uh, men and, and women would uh, unite, of course, in this uh, you know, uh, casual immoral act bending, of course, to the inclinations of the flesh that we all feel. Child sacrifice was also common in the Canaanite uh, culture. In fact, if we were to read on into the times of the kings of Judah and Israel, whenever they went and married the, uh, the, the local people and indulged in the acts of, of those living in Canaan that Joshua was supposed to clean out when they went back into the land, uh, we find out that they took on the customs of the local uh, inhabitants and were also drawn into child sacrifice. And we know that God abhorred that practice. It was an abomination that, that uh, these kings of Israel and, and the, uh, the men and women living in the land of Israel that, that should have known better were sacrificing their own children to pagan gods. It was an abomination to God. The old the whole object of marriage, of course, is, is set out for us beautifully in Genesis chapter two. Right at the end of that chapter, we have the creation of man and we have, of course, the creation of woman. In Genesis chapter two, and in fact, a nice introduction to Genesis chapter two, verse 24, it is the, the preceding verse where Adam, well, verse 22 as an introduction, we know that God took the rib out of the side of uh, Adam and then created the woman from that. And he brought the woman unto Adam. That's a beautiful picture too, isn't it? But we'll look at that echo in just a moment. But verse 23 says that Adam now, acknowledging this, says himself, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So he understands that. But verse 24 cannot be Adam speaking, can it? Because it, this, is the div, this is God. This is a divine intervention here. God will now say, therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And so that idea there, that this divine uh, um, design that God is laying down, is that uh, the, the, the man and the woman should cleave to each other. They should be inseparably joined, almost like superglue together. And they too, having been totally independent and separate, were now going to be one flesh together. And it's an echo. It's a beautiful echo and a, and a type right back from the beginning that God was now going to um, do the same for his uh, his church his called out ones his ecclesia that that uh, christ was going to be if you like that the 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 groom to his his bride i just need to let my dog out very quickly do not adjust your set apologize for that she's been whining <laughs> at the door for the last two minutes so i do apologize <laughs> very distracting okay 
Uh, and we have this beautiful picture actually in, in Revelation chapter 19 of that marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's, the language is exactly the same. It's Christ uh, joining his bride, you and I, in that beautiful marriage supper of the Lamb uh, when Christ returns. We are then that bride. And just like it was in the land of Canaan, when Abraham was there, with all of these immoral acts going on, actually the Apostle Paul also had to write to those believers in Corinth in modern day Greece. The same practices were going on. They, they worshipped uh, in, in, you know, uh, fertility gods uh, and all kinds of immoral things were going on at these temples right next door to where these modern Christian um, believers in the first century were trying to remember uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ and, and meeting together. Uh, and, and the Apostle Paul has to say, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Come out from among them and be ye separate. Don't partake in this. Be totally separate. And whenever we are looking for um, a husband or a wife, we have to think about that, don't we? how we are yoked together. And that whole idea of being yoked together is the same idea of being, uh, or should I say, it's the same idea as the yoke of oxen. Two animals that would carry a plow together need to be the same kind of build, walk at the same um, pace. Because if you put a, a big, strong animal, with pair it with a very small uh, animal, they're not equally yoked together are they they're going to go round and round uh, the field rather than plowing in a straight line and that's the idea when we choose um, a, a husband or a wife or a partner a business partner uh, an associate uh, associate um, that's going to work closely with us that we make sure that we're not unequally yoked in all aspects of our lives and so then Isaac's wife then was not to be from Canaan for, for that particular reason and then Abraham makes it very clear that if this girl, uh, this wife, potential wife for his uh, son, Isaac, uh, was not willing to come into the, the land where Isaac was in his home, um, then Isaac was not to be taken um, to her. That was a, a principle that Abraham uh, was very fearful of. He didn't want that to happen. He didn't want his son to be uh, uh, taken from him into a strange land. And he actually made Eliezer take an oath, as we read in those uh, first few verses of Genesis chapter 24. But you see, Abraham was a faithful man. We already know that. He was extremely confident that God would work with his angels, that God would send his angel with Eliezer and bless the journey and bless the whole process. And so Eliezer packs up 10 camels they didn't have cars or trains then. It was a long journey on foot and they load up these 10 camels and they head north uh, out of the land. And they're going to journey north up to, do you remember where Abraham and his father and his household first stopped having come up from Ur of the Chaldees down south in Mesopotamia? This is where they stopped, wasn't it? And those promises were kind of repeated to Abraham and he was told to, to leave his, uh, his kindred and then to travel into the land of Canaan. So this uh, journey is, is to the household, if you like, the relatives that had stayed in Abraham's um, family, that had stayed in the north. So Abraham knew exactly what he wanted and where he wanted to have a future bride for his son from. This servant, Eliezer, is, is a wonderful man of faith, because when they actually arrive at Nahor with this, the, the 10 camel train, um, we, we can see that this is a big task for Eliezer. A huge responsibility lies on his shoulders. So what does he do? When we read through the narrative, we know that he goes to God in prayer for help. And he, so, you know, sometimes we read God um, appearing, in, in, not appearing, but, but speaking in visions, in dreams to, to Abraham. We know that God would actually introduce these promises through angels uh, with face-to-face -face, um uh, interaction with Abraham and, and with Sarah. Um, so God speaks in different ways, but sometimes he doesn't speak verbally at all. We have to pray to God in faith and, and in faith accept whatever happens is God's answer. And that's exactly what you're going to see in this, this chapter, chapter 24 of Genesis, because Eliezer goes to God in prayer with a request. Um, and it's incredible how this request is answered. So the request was, if it be possible that the, the, the wife that I am expected to choose for my master Abraham, for his son, 
if she offers me water and then offers to get water for my camels, let this be a sign to me that this is the chosen uh, wife of, of Isaac. And we know when we read through the narrative that that's exactly what happens. That Re Rebecca's response when um, uh, she offers uh, Eliezer water to drink, she then goes on to uh, go and get water for his camels. And that's a sure sign to Eliezer that this is the one that God has answered his prayer so immediately and so incredibly clearly. And I'd imagine that all of us at some point have had that clear answer uh, right there and then in front of us and before our very eyes that really enhances our faith. Sometimes God clearly does that for us, doesn't he? And so Eliezer then parts gifts uh, in response to that to Rebecca, knowing that she is the chosen wife um, of, of uh, Isaac. And he gives and bestows her a, a golden jewel to be worn on the forehead we know that in middle east customs that's where not just around the neck that would have been about five grams so i believe there's 28 grams per ounce if that makes any sense to those in in the us and and he gives her a golden bracelet as well that's about four ounces in in weight in verse 27 eliezer gives another prayer this is not a, a prayer giving uh, asking god for help this is a prayer um, that is thanking God for what has been done. But we just get that as we read through this verse. And he said, Bless be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I, being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. He completely acknowledges in thanksgiving that God was in this process. I, being in the way. That's such a beautiful phrase, isn't it, in scripture? And we see it echoed time and time again do you remember the first use of it was right there in genesis chapter three wasn't it right at the beginning um in in the garden of eden it was a negative context if you like because adam and eve were thrust out of the garden and god put there a, a cherubim and a flaming sword to protect the way to the tree of life um but that way is it, it is a phrase that's used over and over again do you remember david would say teach me thy way O lord in in the psalms and Jesus would say as well in the New Testament, I am the way, the truth and the life, the living way, the way of life. And therefore, all figures of, of a life that will result uh, in the gift of eternal life. When we look at Rebecca, we see a beautiful character, don't we? She has the appearance uh, in that chapter 24 of, 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 of beauty, of course, <laughs> um, and uh, purity in character. She has a willingness to help. And think about that for a moment. She offers to get water out for the camels of um, Eliezer. A camel, we don't really use them here in the Western world, but they're still used in the desert because they are so efficient. But they can drink 53 gallons of water in three minutes. So multiply that by 10. That's how much water and that's how much work Rebecca uh, is actually having to do to get water out for Eliezer's uh, camels. What incredible hospitality she offers to have Eliezer back to her family home. And then as we read through the narrative, the conversation that would then go on that, uh, you know, uh, it was so necessary for Rebecca to go back, to travel back to Isaac. It couldn't be the other way around. Isaac wasn't going to come to Rebecca's household. That's a huge leap of faith. And during that meal that Eliezer has with Bethuel and with Laban, uh, Rebecca's father and Rebecca's brother, um, he had to tell, didn't he, why he was there. So all of that information was shared um, from Eliezer, how God had worked, how Abraham had been promised uh, these uh, covenants. And so... Bethuel and Laban would now agree to uh, have their daughter and uh, Laban's sister travel back with Eliezer to go and be with Isaac. What an incredible act of faith. And here in Genesis uh, chapter 24, in these uh, last few verses, verse 51 and 50, Laban and Bethuel answered and said, the thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go and let her be 
thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And so right at the uh, very end of that chapter, they bless Rebecca and said unto her, thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions. What an interesting phrase. That, that's billions, isn't it? And let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. And we would ultimately see that in the seed of promise, ultimately in the Lord Jesus Christ, who would crush the ultimate enemy, which is death and sin. So the servant had not only explained um, all of the material possessions that Abraham had, but also the covenant uh, that Abraham was going to be a father of many people and many nations, that Abraham's seed would conquer his enemies, ultimately through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, Rebecca is brought back. And we know that as she comes back now down from the north, back into the land of Canaan, where Isaac and Abraham were, uh, that as she enters in the evening into the camp, that Isaac sees her and goes to her and she inquires at who this person is and Eliezer tells her and she immediately covers her face and we know the story uh, and we will read the story um, as we go through the Genesis account so Isaac then would take um, Rebecca and he takes her where does he take her to his mother's tent such is the respect and love that he has for his um, dead mother and we're going to read on as we go through the story. What an incredible challenge now Rebecca uh, and Isaac are going to faith, uh, face in bringing about the next seed uh, of promise. Because they were going to face the same problems that Abraham and Sarah uh, had faced uh, previously. So then in summary, um, as we, we look at this story, what are the lessons for us? If we are going to be descendants, not physical descendants, but faithful descendants of Abraham, we too have to hold fast to God, don't we? It is essential that we too think about our choices, that we make them wisely. It's essential too that we choose partners in faith that are suitable for us in our walk, that are help meets for us in our walk, that support, not hinder. Eliezer, if you remember, used prayer didn't he he arrived there in Nahor uh, and the weight of the world was on his shoulders in this task of choosing a wife he put the matter completely to God in faith and in prayer to select a wife let us use prayer also in all of the decisions the key decisions that we make in our lives knowing that God will answer us ultimately if we do that in faith and we've learned that marriage has instituted right back divinely at the beginning of Genesis when God created man and woman that marriage is a union of two people into one two separate units into one unit uh, an inseparable bond sharing common beliefs uh, is the start of a good relationship that you are equally yoked together as you walk every marriage is a divine set example of ultimately Christ and his bride that's you and I um, the ecclesia or, or the church I think that's my Last slide. Back over to you, Bill. I'm sorry you, about Peter. my dog. I'm so, so sorry about my dog. <laughs> no worries. Uh, well, thank you very much. And Jonathan as well. You can certainly see why we continue to ask you to read ahead. Uh, we couldn't read all three chapters that we considered tonight, but we realize that there's so much information in there that's important as we go through it that we can't really cover it in the sessions uh, unless you read ahead. So we ask you to continue to keep reading forward. Now, Isaac was the promised seed, yet Abraham was asked to offer him as a sacrifice. How much faith did Abraham need to have to trust in God for this? Romans chapter 4, verse 20. I've actually referred to this before, but now it seems to have even more impact. It says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. Just think of that phrase. He staggered not. It, it didn't overwhelm, overwhelm him at all in that. And we find that he, it, it goes on to say that he was strong, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. No wonder he stands in the Bible as a paramount example of faith. And so uh, we, we certainly enjoyed tonight's session. We ask you now to please join us as we conclude our session in a word of prayer. Holy Father, we are thankful for this amazing 
record of these faithful men and women of old, whose example of steadfastness and trust in the word that you spoke takes us way beyond what we tend to expect from you, the creator, because now it's in the hearts of men who have this incredible faith to de demonstrate their absolute confidence in your word. We stand here today and we ask, can we have that kind of faith? Can we show that we believe everything that you say? And the answer is, yes, we can. We know it's difficult, though, because we are burdened with a nature that has been passed down through the generations. But we stand in this, in this era, Holy Father, in the hope that Jesus will soon come, that he shall deliver his people from the burden of flesh, and that we shall all stand together in that kingdom period. So please guide us to that day and help us in our walk that we may see that we can have the strength through prayer and through believing with our whole heart, we can overcome even in the strongest and most powerful trials of our life. So please hear us now, we pray, for it's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.